Hey everybody, this is Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I'm coming to you this week, uh, possibly with two videos, but for sure one, we'll have to see how time goes. And um, this week, again, we're featuring my book, uh, Don't Pass Over Easter, A New Defense of Easter in Acts 12.4. And this is about the uh, King James Bible reading in, e in Acts 12.4, where it says Easter. And of course, all the modern versions in that verse read Passover. So there's a lot of discussion and debate usually this time of year as we uh, get closer and closer to Easter about <clears throat> that reading in the King James Bible and whether or not it's accurate and uh, whether or not it's uh, accurately translated Easter. I do believe that Easter is the correct word, and I do have a little bit of a different take on that, though, than some King James uh, advocates have had in the past. So if you want to check that out, I recommend that to you. I'll put a link to, in the comments. Also, I want to tell you again about our new Rumble channel. We're preparing uh, some alt text sites at Grace Life Bible Church should uh, we be canceled or something like that. And right now we have 19 subscribers. So uh, if you're into alt text sites, et cetera, you should look for us on Rumble and uh, we'd be happy to have you subscribe. In this video, what I'm going to be talking about, I'm titling this video, Inconsistencies and Problems with Recent Arguments About the Little Flock Judgment Seat of Christ and the Rapture, Part 1. Again, inconsistencies and problems with recent arguments about the little flock, the Judgment Seat of Christ, and the Rapture, Part 1. I actually have some uh, printed notes that I'm going to be using for this. Normally, I, I don't. I just have kind of things laid out in my head, but I want to make sure that I uh, am saying accurately what I want to convey. So this video up here uh, that I have on the screen by uh, Brother Osteen, uh, is the rapture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to commend that to you as a response to some teaching that happened last week, uh, last Wednesday and Thursday, and then this past Sunday on the 21st, uh, related to this subject matter, uh, saying that the rapture of the church is not in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 or in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach than what Brother Osteen did. Brother Osteen kind of just approached it from the a standpoint of an exposition of the doctrine and the, the, the biblical passages. Um, but I commend this video to you. I'll put it this in the comments in the description below. If you're interested, uh, make sure that you check it out. My main focus, though, is to point out the inconsistent and uh, problematic nature of the positions, hermeneutical methods and use of Scripture. And this would be the position that the uh, little the, that the the little flock is going to the judgment seat of Christ, and that the rapture of the church cannot be found in the Acts period epistles, uh, as we heard explained last week. So specifically, I'm going to be addressing um, some teaching that was done on Wednesday, March 17th. The title of it was um, "Reading 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter." Then the following day, Thursday, March 18th, there was a study done titled pre -tribulation, The Pre-Tribulation Rapture of the Church. And then Sunday, March 21, a video titled, uh, O Death, Where is Thy Sting? So my main focus here is going to be pointing out problematic and inconsistent argumentation that we can see as we really dissect this, this teaching. First of all, there's nothing new in this teaching, uh, as I'm going to show not only in this video, but but probably more so in, in the next one, is that most of the main things that have been said um, have been said before. So the idea that this is new or that, you know, the, that, that there's wholly new things here uh, just just isn't true. Um, mo most of the position that uh, has been enunciated at least last week about the rapture uh, is, is really the uh, the position of Charles H. Welch and the X-28 position, which we'll get into more next time. So I'm more concerned with the argumentation. So, uh, so I'm going to be addressing sort of these three studies again from March 17, March 18, and March 21 as sort of a, a, a block. Um, and I'll try to be very clear as far as uh, where, which study I'm referencing at what time in each study uh, so that you can really track with this as we go through this. So the first study from last Sunday was on first, sorry, last Wednesday was on First Corinthians fifteen. Okay, so let's let's read the first uh, four verses. Verse one. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. 
For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. So this, these four verses are the gospel. They are the gospel in a nutshell, okay? They are the gospel reduced down to its most basic statement. Now, many of the things that Paul says here in verses 3 and 4 are elaborated on much more thoroughly in uh, Romans, specifically chapters 3 and 4, where Paul explains in detail the issue of justification by grace through faith. Okay. Now, I want you to notice here that it says brethren. And the teacher in the video that I'm, uh, the videos that I'm referring to is very clear that these four verses are our gospel. Now, when I say our gospel, I mean the gospel by which we today, living in the dispensation of grace, but in the 21st century, okay, so nearly 2,000 years after Paul, that we are saved today, that any man, woman, child, Jew, Gentile today is saved by trusting that Christ died on the cross for their sins was buried and rose again. Now, obviously, I also maintain that this is the gospel. The gospel that saves today is stated in a nutshell here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Notice he says brethren, though, so that's not my issue. My issue is not whether or not this is the gospel. My issue is the consistent application of this of this understanding throughout 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So notice the brethren here, okay, declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Now, um, if you come down to verse 50, so we're still in 1 Corinthians 15, let's come down and look at verse 50. Notice what verse 50 says, okay? Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Okay? So here's, here's uh, sorry about that error message there. Here is my main question here. Okay? So when exactly did Paul stop? talking to, when did he start talking to a different set of brethren? Because the main teacher of the new view is is adamant that verses 1 through 4 are the gospel. I agree, verses 1 through 4 are the gospel, but then down if you come down to verse 50, now all of a sudden this is a different group. So verses 1 through 4 are talking to the church, the body of Christ of this dispensation, but it, Paul is now talking to the little flock, according to the new view, when you get to verse 50, when he is still saying brethren, all right? And notice also, and this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So Paul's including himself in there with these brethren when he says and uses the word we. So um, along with this idea, um, so it's, it's, it's clearly stated that, uh, first Corinthians chapter 15 verses one through four, the gospel that saves today, but it was taught last Wednesday that this, this, uh, coming here, this changing that's being referred to in verses 50 through 53, that this is talking about the little flock and the last trump. Notice what it says here. Okay. Behold, I show you a mystery. Verse 51. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump for the trumpet shall sound. So according to what was said, that is connected with Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. But in the days of the seventh angel, when he began to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. And he, uh, and he hath declared to his, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. So the idea was that the last trump is the seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation, and that this event that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a little flock event that doesn't happen until, you know, some point in the tribulation when the seventh trumpet sounds, because it talks about the last trumpet. So verses 1 through 4 are talking about us, the body of Christ, and how we get saved. But now all of a sudden in verse 50, with even though he uses the word brethren, when he used brethren in verse 1, he's now all of a sudden talking to not only a different group, but he's talking to a different group about a prophetic, prophesied event. When Paul says, behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed. So my question is, when exactly did Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, when exactly did he switch from talking about 
one group of brethren that had believed in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, i.e., they had believed Paul's gospel that had been preached unto them, as it says here in the first uh, four verses. Notice what it says again. He says, the gospel, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, and which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So when exactly did he switch from talking about or talking to a group of people that had believed his gospel, the gospel that he preached unto them, that he had received, that he delivered unto them, okay? When exactly did he switch from talking to a group of people that's saved by the same gospel that you and I are saved today, according to the main teacher of the, of the new view, to a different group of brethren down here in verse 50, that is now a, the little flock, and they're saved by a different gospel, and now he's talking about the prophetic second coming. When exactly, what verse between verse 4 and verse 50 establishes the fact that Paul has now not talking to people who were saved by his gospel anymore, and is now talking to a, a different, a wholly different group of brethren um, than who he was addressing in the first four verses, Okay. Folks, this is yet another example of what I've called in my previous videos the taxicab fallacy, okay? You cannot just pick and choose what you want to be pertinent and what you don't want to be pertinent, and that is what is going on here. I want you to also notice that Paul uses the pronoun we. Behold, I show, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So again, if this is the little flock here, and Paul's saying we, is he including himself with the little flock? Is Paul a member of the little flock? Or isn't he? Because he's clearly including himself with these people that shall not all sleep, but that shall be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So Paul is Paul a member of the body of Christ, or is he a member of the little flock? Because he's using the pronoun we. So was Paul including himself with the little flock that would be changed at the seventh trump? So or was Paul going to be a part of the group that in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. So is he a part of this group that's going to experience this event, which is described in all of the videos from March 17th, March 18th, and March 21st as being our rapture. And by our rapture, I mean ours as in the church, the body of Christ. This is our rapture here. But 1 Corinthians 15 is not our rapture. This is something pertaining to the little flock prophetically, even though Paul says we. So is Paul part of this group that's going to go through part of the tribulation, according to what was said the last Wednesday, and then be changed at the, at the seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation, chapter 10? Or is he part of this group that is going to be, you know, caught away to meet the Lord in the air. And when the Lord shall, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. Which group is Paul a part of here? Okay. Is he going to pass? Say, ah, you know, I'll pass on that rapture there in Colossians chapter three, verse four, so that uh, he can by all means save some in the little flock. Because what is said about this, we is that Paul's including himself with these people so that he might by all means save some. So, Paul's use of the pronoun we. So if we think about the use of the pronoun we, this is something that has come up, that came up way back at the beginning of the current controversy. So Paul's use of the pronoun we has been a center of, has been at the center of the current controversy since it began on Sunday, November 15th, 2020, with the message titled Reigning with Christ. Okay. In both places, so we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So again, we see we. We see we here, and we see we here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. So in both places where the judgment seat of Christ is explicitly mentioned, whether that's uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 10, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul is using the pronoun we. So from the beginning of the controversy last November, when all this started with the message on November 15th, reigning with Christ, from the beginning, many have been asking the following question, or they asked the following question. If the judgment seat of Christ was only for the little flock, and Paul said we, thereby including himself with those who would go to the judgment seat of Christ, was Paul a member of the little flock? Well, that had been the question for a long time. 
The topic was finally addressed on December 24 and December 27 in messages on 2 Corinthians 5 and Romans chapter 14. Now, in those messages from December 24 and December 27, um, in those videos, it was taught that the context of 2 Corinthians 5 was the little flock. Okay, that the, that the context of 2 Corinthians 5 was the little flock. And it was taught that, okay, uh, let me make sure I get this right, It uh, based upon the word dissolved. Okay, so chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. So it was said, well, dissolved, that's Israel's language. Dissolved is eight times. Eight is the number of new beginnings. And um, the law first mentioned shows this word dissolved being used for the first time in a Jewish context. So it was said that dissolved is not our language in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, in other words, it doesn't apply to the body of Christ. Okay, it doesn't apply to the body of Christ. So the following comments were made in the video from December 27. At the 22 minute mark, it was stated, this is written to people who know exactly uh, who who know exactly what to be dissolved means. It is flat out not our language. So this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, is written to people then who are members of the little flock. In that same message, around the same timestamp, it was stated that the body of Christ will be changed in a moment. You're going to get a new body. At the 23 minute 50 second mark, the language of being dissolved is used eight times in your King James Bible, and it has to do with Israel, and it has to do with the little flock. So the reason why, so understand, let me make this clear. People were asking, why does it say, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ? Why is Paul including the word we as somebody who would be at the judgment seat of Christ if the judgment seat of Christ was only for the little flock as it had been asserted? That was a question from the very beginning of the controversy. So when that finally got around to being discussed on December 24 and 27, nearly over a month after the controversy started, this is the reasoning that we were given. Dissolved is a Jewish word. We have a building of God on house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Our language, the language of the body of Christ, is that we're changed. The language here is dissolved because dissolved is mentioned the first time in the Old Testament in an Israelite context. Therefore, this context in this language isn't our language. It's the language of the little flock. Okay. Along with that reasoning, verses in Isaiah and, and 2 Peter 3, among others, highlighting how dissolved only applied to Israel's prophetic program, were put on the screen and demonstrated. Okay, so let me just make sure everybody's clear. Therefore, it was argued in late December 2020 that the judgment seat of Christ is not for the body of Christ because dissolved is not the language of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is changed, not dissolved. The context of 2 Corinthians 5 is therefore Jewish and pertains to the little flock because of the use of the word dissolved. That's what was stated. So that was the justification for why only the little flock would be at the judgment seat of Christ, even though Paul used the word we. And I need to add to this. It was also said that Paul used the word we because this is an example of him trying to become all things to all men, um, as though that would explain why Paul is using the word we. That Paul becoming all things to all men explains some of the reasons why Paul did certain things during the Acts period in his desire to win the Jews, his kinsmen according to the flesh. But here he's writing under inspiration of God. And he's using the word we, and we were told that the reason why this context is Jewish and pertaining to the little flock is because dissolved is a Jewish word, changed is a body of Christ word, okay? On Thursday, let me, whoops, uh, January 21st, uh, 2021, January 21st, 2021, I produced a video titled Thoughts on 2 Corinthians 5 in which I responded to many of the illogical statements that had been made about the word dissolved, among other things. So I have a video, which I'll put in the comments, titled Second Thoughts on 2 Corinthians 5, where I 
explained this particular passage and demonstrated that this dichotomy that is created because of the rigid use of the law of first mention that says this is this can only be a Jewish word dissolved and change is only a body of Christ's word, and then showed how if you go down into this passage, how the same teachers that want the first 10 verses to be about the little flock, they want to apply later on in the chapter the new creature to the church, the body of Christ. They want the ambassadorship to apply to the church, the body of Christ in verse 20, and they want the imputed righteousness of God to apply to the body of Christ in verse 21. This is the same taxicab fallacy that we saw when we were looking at the gospel and the use of the word brethren in 1 Corinthians 15 earlier in this video. So um, I address that, okay? On Thursday, and I did that again on January 21st, 2021, on Thursday, February 11, the now famous Grace Swamp message was delivered in which my teaching from January 21st was misrepresented. It was in a, uh, it was an uh, illusion, and it was an illusion was made to the fact that I said that perish and dissolved were the same word. Okay, so I have been talking about the fact that Paul in chapter four of Second Corinthians uses terminology to talk about the human body. He talks about it being an earthen vessel. He talks about our mortal flesh, flesh, and he talks about our outward man that's perishing. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, he talks about the earthly house of this tabernacle, if it were dissolved. And so I was talking about how chapter 5, verse 1 is building upon the things that Paul had said in the previous chapter, okay? But it was presented that I said they were the same word. So I challenge anybody who is an honest interlocutor who wants to really know what I said and know what was taught and not just take somebody's word for it to go to my video from January 21st on thoughts on 2 Corinthians 5 and see where I said that perish and uh, dissolve were the same word. But here's the problem, okay? The law first mentioned, and, and you know, you can't, it, you can't use a dictionary. You can't look anything up in Greek. You can't use any study tools unless you're running word searches that are approved by the people that are in charge of this uh, new paradigm of thought. You, But they're not using these things honestly. And this is one of the inconsistencies. So we're told that perish and dissolve are totally different words and that they never mean the same thing. So let me be very precise in what I'm saying. I never said that perish and dissolve were the same word. However, does the King James Bible use them as synonyms? And this is a point that has been overlooked, ignored, and not discussed. Okay, so let's go to Psalm 102. Let's look at verse 25. Notice what it says. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hand. So this is talking about the heavens and the earth, right? Verse 26, they shall perish. Okay, what's going to perish? The earth, the heavens and the earth are going to what? Perish. But thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou what? Hmm, change them. So here is the word perish being used in conjunction with the word change, and it says they shall be changed. But here's what I want you to see. What's going to happen to the heavens and the earth according to Psalm 102? They're going to what? They're going to perish, right? Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and all the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then all these things shall be what? Dissolved. Well, what's really interesting and what you're never told is that what the King James Bible says is going to be dissolved, another passage says is going to perish. So, again, folks, we're not, we're not, you're not being presented accurate information. You are only being presented information that is you that, that that makes the point that they want to make, that the main teachers of this doctrine want to make. 
the information is not being presented in an honest way because what the King James Bible says is going to perish, the heavens and the earth, also the King James Bible says is going to be dissolved. So if you can't accurately present basic information, that's a problem. And if folks don't want to acknowledge that or want to pretend like that's not happening, then they do so to their own peril. Okay. On Wednesday, March 17th, we were told that, that, so let's, let's bring all this sort of back to the, um, where we started. Let's kind of bring it back full circle. On Wednesday, March 17th, we were told that first Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 53 occurs during the 70th week of Daniel when the seventh trumpet is blown and it pertains to the little flock. So again, uh, that's this verse right here. Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. That's then cross reference with Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, to say that, well, this is happening during the tribulation period when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. And Paul's no longer, Paul's now talking about into the little flock here in verses 50 through 54. Okay. Now, do you see the problem? Here, we were told that dissolved never is connected with change. Although, if you look at Psalm 12, what do you see? It's never, it, it, it is connected to change. They're going to change, okay? The, the heavens and the earth are going to be changed. They're going to melt with fervent heat. They're going to be dissolved, right? But we were told that dissolved, that's... Little flock language, that's not your language. You, as a member of the church, the body of Christ, you are going to be changed. That's what we were told on December 24th and December 27th as a contextual justification for why the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.10 only applies to the little flock, right? Now, last less than a week ago, we hear a message that says this passage is about the little flock when it says that the people involved in this event are going to be changed. So which is it? But wait, I thought changed is the language of the body of Christ. That's what we were told on December 24 and December 27, 2002, or sorry, 2020. But here, the little flock, the little flock is now being changed, not dissolved when the entire justification for why this verse right here was not about the body of Christ, was about the little flock, was based upon a bunch of word games that were played with 2 Corinthians 5.1 and the word dissolved. Okay, so as I've already said, this is contrary to what was taught uh, in December 2020 as justification for why the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.10 is talking about the little flock. Don't miss it, folks. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. The very reasoning used to argue one point in 2 Corinthians 5 is now abandoned to argue something opposite in 1 Corinthians 15. This is not consistent. This is a major intellectual problem with the position. So, you're not being given you're not being given honest information okay so wednesday of last week on the 17th we heard that this event oops let me get back to the right position that this event is going to happen at some point during the tribulation when the seventh trump sounds okay even though this word is changed even though it says changed and change was supposed to be the language of the little flock last december now all of a sudden it's not now all of a sudden this is the little flock I just showed you that what was said about dissolved and perished and changed wasn't accurate information. So the information is changing as the position is being unfolded. Okay. So on Sunday, March 21st, two days ago from when I'm making this video on the 23rd, in O Death, Where Is Thy Sting? The position, the position set forth three days earlier on Wednesday, March 17th was abandoned. So instead of 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 53, taking place at the last trump, 
in Revelation 10, verse 7, it's now occurring, it's now occurring after the millennial reign of Christ is over. It's now occurring after the reign of Christ is over. Yet Paul said that he, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Folks, listen, you can believe what you want to believe, and I also agree that you should be fully persuaded in your own mind. But you got to fully understand and comprehend what you're being told here and what, what the issues are. So Wednesday, it's the last Trump, the seventh Trump. That's when this is going to happen, and we're going to be changed. This is the little flock. Even though even though the, a dichotomy of, of language was used back in December to establish that 2 Corinthians 5.10 was a little flock context, okay, never mind that. So what happened to the last Trump between last Wednesday the 17th and Sunday the 21st? What about the we that shall be changed? Does this include Paul? So when it's taught Wednesday, the focus is on the last Trump. Then when it's taught Sunday, nothing is said about the last Trump. So why the why the change in three days' time? Okay. So here is my observation. The hermeneutical system. The system and methodology of interpretation that is being used to make these statements about the little flock and about the judgment seat of Christ and about the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it is being made up in real time in front of your very eyes. So what mattered on Wednesday, the last Trump, doesn't matter anymore on Sunday. Folks, this is an inconsistent use of Scripture. This is an inconsistent use of Scripture. Okay? And again, the errors of logic are as follows. In this entire, I've listened to every single one of the videos in this controversy, some of them multiple, two, three, four times. There's the use of false dichotomy. There's the appeal to emotion. Every video has an appeal to emotion, some testimonial just about of, oh, well, so-and-so wrote me and they said this and that, as, as though that is verification that what is being taught is correct. There's an appeal to authority. I see it all over Facebook and social media. Well, so-and-so studies their Bible 80 hours a week. That's great. But studying your Bible 80 hours a week does not mean that what you're saying is true. That's an appeal to authority. Okay, or X number of people agree with this, or hundreds upon hundreds of people are, are are sharing with me worldwide that they agree with this. That's appeal to authority. That does not mean that what is being said is correct. There's the taxi cab fallacy, like we've demonstrated here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. How do you get verses 1 through 4 to be our gospel that saves us today when he says brethren, and then you come down in the same chapter in the same context, and he says brethren, and now all of a sudden he's talking about a different group of people. Okay. There's also the Gish Gallup fallacy of just overwhelming with information. I mean, a lot of folks, I've, I hear from folks too, that they cannot keep up with the amount of information that is being put out every week because it's just boom, 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 one thing on top of the other. And unless you're thinking about this, and unless you're evaluating what's said recently with what was said before, you're going to miss the inconsistencies about dissolved and changed, about how change was a body of Christ's word. But now all of a sudden, in this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, changed is now all of a sudden about the body, about the little flock and something that's going to happen for them in the future. Just don't remember what I said before in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay, so. If you don't agree with the new position, you will be accused of being unteachable. You will be accused of being, you know, just buying into the American Bible narrative, whatever that means. Okay, you'll be accused of being unteachable um, if you don't agree with the uh, view that is being put forth. And what all that means is that in order for you to be considered teachable, you have to agree. And you have to watch all of the videos. And there's no way that you can understand what's being said unless you've watched all the videos. Well, okay, I suppose to some degree that that's true. But it doesn't mean that people aren't watching the videos and objecting to what they're seeing. 
And lastly, if you don't agree, you will be accused of not being a real King James Bible believer. And if you use a dictionary, if you look up a, a Greek word to see how else it's translated in the King James Bible, um, if you do, you know, if you use Blue Letter Bible or a Bible search program, you know, you're not a real King James Bible believer, which again, you know, I don't know how people are doing searches and finding the first occurrences of words unless they're using a, a, a hard copy of the Strong's Concordance or they're using Sword Searcher or eSword or Blue Letter Bible as I have up here on the screen. But if you don't agree with the position as it's being articulated by the main enunciators of the view, then you're not a King James Bible believer. And if you were, you would see it the way that they are explaining it. No. There are a host of reasons, folks, of inconsistencies and inconsistencies and problems with this that this video has hopefully um, uh, been able to uh, bring to your attention. Now, before we go, I want to remind you about the book, Don't Pass Over Easter. And you can order this uh, direct from the publisher. I'll put the link for the uh, hard, uh, excuse me, the paperback and the Kindle format in the comments. I also want to remind you about our Rumble channel. So if you're into alt tech sites, you can uh, go ahead and subscribe to our Rumble channel. We'd love to see you over there on Rumble. And then also just a reminder about gracelifebiblechurch.com. We are live streaming on YouTube and Facebook on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And all that's our adult Sunday school hour where we're currently looking at, at and studying the Bishop's Bible as we work our way towards the King James. And then in 1040, we have our main service. And there we're studying the book of Colossians. So before you go, I just want to say, if you've never trusted the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've never believed 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4, to the salvation of your, your soul eternally, I just want to say that if you believe and trust that Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, you can pass from death to life right now. And I ask you to do that today before it's everlasting too late. See you next time.